It is called Awareness is Everything. And I, I just want to, to walk you through the setup to get your mind to start flowing because I know you just got overpowered with some worship and, and now I want you to draw it in and get focused. But have you ever seen someone that lacks awareness? Anyone in here ever seen someone that lacks awareness? Like, like have you ever seen someone who lacks awareness while driving? Anybody ever seen someone that lacks awareness? I'm, man, I am YouTube crazy about people that just totally jack people. Like I saw this minivan, this, this, this guy sitting there on a motorcycle, like a nice, big, fast motorcycle, and a guy just turns left and just rams him. And I'm like, what was he thinking there? And so awareness, like have you ever seen a marriage where someone or both lacked awareness? Anybody ever seen that? Anybody been to an uncomfortable dinner where the other couple decided it was time to fight it out right in front of any, everybody? Has anybody ever seen this go down, right? Like, I don't care. I don't care that they're here. It's the truth. I'm going to say it. it oh. Ooh. How about them Cubs? Anybody? <laughs> Who's playing the Cowboys this week? Uh, I mean, it's just incredibly uncomfortable when people are unaware. Has anyone ever seen unawareness or lack of awareness when it comes to parenting? Anybody? 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 Their kid is over there lighting things on fire, punching other kids. They're like, oh, he's so cute. He's so cute. Look at him over there. Literally, no one else thinks that's cute. Can I say it on behalf of every parent in here? If your kid is destroying the world, it's not cute, okay? Anyway, had a parent come in my house when I was a young married couple, no kids. So really kids are off limits to people that don't have kids. And so anyway, brought this toddler over and I had this very nice gift because Carrie and I had nothing, but a gift was given to us of this little Queen Anne coffee table. Beautiful. It was sitting there and this, this little girl came in, just two, I don't know, two and a half, maybe three. And it was clear that there was no discipline going on in this house. And um, mom gave her a little lemon drop, lemon drops, put it in there. And she's like, and apparently she was done with it. And I know this because she looked right at me and she ah, just spit it out right there on the coffee table. And her mom was like, oh, look at that. Look at that. Just left it there. No, we're not gonna clean this up. No, 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 that's your table. Anyway, I, I just, I've seen some things. I've seen some things. And today we're gonna cover, I, I hate to bear this to, news to you, we're only gonna cover two verses in our John chapter. That's all we're gonna have time for today because there's so much good in it. We're gonna recap a couple verses and we're gonna look at the disciples' level of awareness with what God was doing. And it's unfortunate because I know myself many times, I get so wrapped up in what I'm thinking about. I get so wrapped up in what I'm doing. I get so wrapped up in my own problems or stresses or whatever they may be that I can't see what God is doing right in front of me. And I want you to just think with me, this is gonna be about 15 to 20 minutes. I want you to try to laser focus in for 15 to 20 minutes, and I want you to just take the world, okay? Let's all agree right now. Let's take the world and all of your thoughts and all of the pressures and all of the things that are going wrong in your life, all the decisions that are weighing so heavy on your heart. And what if you agreed with me right now that for the next 15 to 20 minutes, you're gonna set those aside and you're going to listen for a word from God. I want you to try this today and see if your interaction with God doesn't change in a worship service. It says in John chapter four, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus, in the most demonstrative revelation of himself, answers the most unlikely of people. 
We've already established she's been married five times and the guy she's living with currently is not her husband. She is an outcast in her society. Being a Samaritan and Jesus being a Jew, this was already not kosher. And yet God demonstrates his ultimate love that there is no one unworthy of grace. No sin has gone so far that he would not be willing to entertain a conversation of forgiveness. And so Jesus says, I am he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. Verse 27, just then the disciples arrived. This is like the most amazing God moment, the most incredible, awesome revelation of God to man just occurred. It all just went down. There's like glory in the atmosphere. Like, have you ever walked in on something, for better or worse, and you don't know what it is, but you know something, right? You know something has happened. Have you ever gone to the concession stand or the restroom at the game, and you're, you're sitting there in line, and all of a sudden, the roar rises up, and you're like, where's that TV? Where's that? And you gotta, you gotta figure out, right? Because you know you know something happened and you might have missed out on what it was. The disciples walked up and this incredible conversation is wrapping up. And just as his disciples arrived, they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Not just any woman, with a Samaritan. Though they were amazed and they had thoughts. It's like sometimes you have some thoughts, but you keep them on the inside. And in this moment, the disciples had some thoughts, but they didn't want to say what they were thinking, but yet they were thinking it. And it's amazing that Jesus knows what you're thinking this morning. And you'll be amazed before we get done today that he sent me to share some things with you that only he could have known about. And you'll be sitting out there if you were invited by a friend wondering if they told me that you were coming, which I obviously don't even know who you are. And yet... God is trying to share something with you this morning. How critical awareness is. The disciples, listen to this, walked up. They arrived at awesome, yet they experienced average because their awareness was limited. God had just poured himself out into an unlikely vessel, and yet they're sitting there looking, why is he talking to her. I mean, come on. If he's God, I mean, if he's a prophet, if he's a great man, there's no way he would take time on this, dare I say, trash. And they're sitting there having these thoughts. Why? What in the world is he doing? Awareness. Awareness. I wonder what we might be missing that God is doing right in front of us because we lack awareness. I, I wonder the thing that he's using in your life right now, he's trying to get your attention, but because you lack awareness, because you lack focus, because your past prejudices might have poisoned your perception of the interaction because culturally, it was like she's a woman and she's a Samaritan, so we don't do that. So is it possible that our past perceptions and experiences with other people might color and poison what God is trying to get to us? And so we allow these poison perceptions to deflect the message that God is trying to get to us. Oh, I, I wonder this morning how many things we're missing because if you haven't heard from God lately, I can assure you it's not because he decided to quit talking. I think that the onus is generally on us that we stopped listening at some point. So this morning we can correct that. We can fix that. We can turn that around. I just want to ask you, when Jesus interacts with this woman, it is clear, it is clear that people matter to him. So I want to ask you a probative question this morning. Do people 
matter to you? Is his passion your priority this morning? How are you interacting with 107s in your realm? Are you reaching them? Are you trying to love them? Are you trying to share grace with them? Or do you walk by on the other side of the road like the Levite and the priest in the Good Samaritan? When is the last time you loved a 107 all the way to the cross? Man, if, if you haven't done that in a while, let's, let's get refocused on what our priorities should be. Because I think you would agree with me that whatever his passion is should be our priority. But we substitute our passions and we make them, instead of his passion, our passion. The next thing you know, we're following and we are chasing after the most empty things, believing they can fill our lives. When you lack awareness, I hate to tell you this, it says they were amazed. When you lack awareness, you'll be amazed for all the wrong reasons. They were amazed that he was talking to this woman. Uh, now, now let's, let's take off our spiritual disguise that we wear to church. Anybody? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you act like everything's great in your life when you come to church. Like you went out there and you shook everybody's hand. You're like, hey, how's it going? Hey, yeah, these are the kids. Yeah, we're just doing it all great. And really all hell's breaking loose in your house, okay? I know, okay, I get it. Everybody puts on their, their Clark Kent suit when they come into church, all right? You got your disguise on. I get it, I get it, I get it. But, but I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to get past the armor that's on the outside and hit you in the heart today. And I want you to, to start thinking with me that if you lack awareness, we tend to get into the driver's seats and whenever we have a lack of awareness, we get amazed and we start having these weird conversations with God and we start saying to God things like, God, what are you doing? I mean, why? Why, God, did you let that happen? God, when are you going to do something about that? Now, don't look at me spiritual because some of you, you've had experiences like me. Have you ever seen a really wicked person that just seemingly everything they do turns to gold and they get blessed and you're trying to do the right thing and you're just getting hammered by the world? Anybody say amen if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, the world just kicking, just kicking. And you're looking at some guy that's cheating, stealing, you know, committing adultery and it just seems like they're winning in life, man. And you're sitting there looking at God saying, God, when are you, when, when's it gonna be my turn? When's it gonna be fair? You might even be tempted to say like the disciples here in this story who were so amazed that Jesus would be doing this. Amazed like they had disdain for it. Amazed like they were looking over their eyebrows saying, what is he doing? You might even be tempted at some point in your life to say, well, if I were God, I certainly wouldn't have done it like that. Have you ever been tempted to have that thought that you told God how you would have preferred it had been done instead of the way that he did it? Man, that presumption has to come from one place and that's the pride of believing that we know better than God. Wow. The disciples presumed in their pride that they knew better than God about how to interact or whether or not he should interact with a sinner. I'm so glad that people aren't choosing for me whether or not God should interact with me. Is anybody else glad about that? Because if you made certain mistakes in life, there'd be a lot of people who are like, God, just leave them on the side of the road and let them rot and die because of what they've done. And yet God is never letting other people decide the message that he's trying to get to you. And we should say amen and clap because God still cares about us. I thought about one time where this presumption crescendos in the Bible, and I wanna use this as an illustration to you, and man, Jesus is getting ready to jump out the roof inside of this house. Watch this, I'm, oh, this is so good. God brought this to, I mean, it's so good. In John chapter 11, 
there were three incidences in which it stated emphatically that Jesus should have done it a different way. I want you to watch how this, how this unfolds. Which is Martha walks up to him first and says, Jesus, if you had been here, oh, that's some guilt right there. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I mean, who else would you ever say that to but Jesus, right? I mean, you don't say that to your friend. He can't do anything about it. He's dead. Martha, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She runs and gets Mary, says the master's calling for you. Mary comes back and she says, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Two witnesses, Martha, Mary, and then the crowd sees Jesus weeping and they said how he loved him. And then they said this, if he could cause the blind to see, if he would have just been here, he could have, he could have done something about this. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. Someone came here today, maybe it's just one, and you are singing this song. God, if you had just been here when I needed you, then you could have done something about my situation. You have some tragedy, you have some agony, and he's saying that tragedy and agony are my specialty. They are the stage for which I take the center and I speak in them because I can do things that other people can't do. Watch what Jesus did. We're gonna walk through this slowly, folks. He said in verse 39, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister deceased, uh, sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by now the body is going to have a bad smell because he's been buried for four days. Jesus responded to her, did I not tell you? If you believe, oh my gosh, you will see the glory of God. Oh, there must be a connection between believing and seeing. Like the disciples didn't believe enough in who Jesus was to see that it was possible that he might be willing to have a conversation with a person that looked broken beyond repair, that needed grace greater than all our sin. I mean, they didn't see that, right? They couldn't see that at the time. And Jesus is saying right here, if you would believe, that you would see my glory. The level of belief is going to determine the level of vision. He said, so they took away the stone. Jesus looked upward and he said, Father, I thank you that you have listened to me. I know that you've always listened to me, but I said it for their sake. <laughs> He's not talking to hear himself talk. Every word, he said, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus in grave clothes, he came bopping out. He's doing the hop, the dead hop, all right? Listen to this. He said, unwrap him and set him free. Unwrap him and let him go. Oh my gosh, Jesus, if you had been here, then this would not have happened. He said, it happened because I was going to be here. Are you kidding me right now? All right, does that not excite you that God could step into your situation and though it looks like it's dead and hopeless and in your mind, you're sitting there in your pride, in your presumption, saying that it could have been different than what it was? No, it's your vision that is limited. If you look long enough and you look hard enough and the spirit of God is in you enough and you believe big enough, oh, I promise you, there is glory in your story. Man, this morning, if you would shift your perspective, if your belief could get a little bigger, it's right in front of you. Man, it's right in front of you. You're just not seeing it. Man. Lazarus, unwrap him and let him go. The woman at the well, unwrap her and let her go. 
my gosh, Jesus is giving us a master class in reaching the 107. Jesus is whispering in your ear today, the doubters, the broken, those far from God, to all the prodigals in the house, listen to me. God is saying to Mary, Martha, the crowd, and the disciples watching was disdain at this woman at this well. Just because you don't know what I'm doing doesn't mean I don't know what I'm doing. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Just because you don't know what I'm doing doesn't mean I don't know what I'm doing. It may not make sense to you right now, but if you would grow a little, dig a little deeper, read a little bit more of the Bible, and you would pray a little bit more for the Spirit to fill you a little bit more, then I promise you at some point it would become evident that he knows what he's doing. Give him praise in his house this morning. That's verse one. You ready for verse two? Let's do it. John chapter four as the disciples walk up, as they're looking with disdain, what is he even doing? Why is he even talking to her? It says that this woman left the water jar. Now, what did she come out to do? She came to get water at a well. You have to have a clay pot. You have to have a clay jar to get the water. You drop the bucket in the well, you draw it up, you pour it in the water, and then you have your thirst filled for the day. The argument from Jesus was, you are trying to solve temporal issues, I'm trying to solve eternal issues. And so it says that after they had this conversation, <laughs> that she took the thing that she thought would bring her satisfaction, and she laid it on the ground, and she walked away. Now watch this. It says that the woman left her water jar and went into the town and told the men, come see the man that told me everything I ever did. And they left the town and made their way to him. So the, the, the town center with a scarlet letter, been married five times, made five mistakes, and now living with someone else becomes the preacher, are you, are, are you, becomes the mouthpiece of God. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. When we shift our source, our lives will change. She went from the clay pot to a different vessel. You see, it's amazing in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It's, watch this. Put the verse up there. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the all-surpassing power from God is him. It's from God, not from us. She traded what she was for what God had to offer. She literally put one clay pot down as God filled the clay pot of her soul. And he did it because he put a billboard out for every lost sinner that ever made a mistake, that ever cheated, that ever lied, that ever hustled and ever led someone astray and then realized in guilt and shame, I had blown it, I had made a terrible mistake. He said, that is a billboard for my grace. Listen, listen. Think of the contrast. She came out to him empty. And she left filled. Five broken relationships. She came out to him looking. And she left loved. Five divorces. She came out to him broken. And she left blessed. Think about that. It says that they had a religious discussion. She had all the religion in the world and yet didn't have a relationship with God. And Jesus didn't try to give her more religion. He gave her redemption. He didn't give her more guilt. Can you imagine how bad she already felt? He didn't give her more guilt. He gave her more grace. He didn't give her more shame. He traded her beauty for ashes. I mean, Jesus Christ is incredible. And at some point, you must stop and take note that she shifted the source. She went from what she was to what she could be. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment, because I'm going to wrap it up right here with 
OU, Texas, Red River rivalry. I mean, we had one of the best, maybe the best game in our history of fighting it out yesterday. And I know with glee in one of our group meets, people were already hammering me. They were doing it on Facebook. They were doing it on Instagram. I mean, anywhere that I could get it, I was getting it. And I think to myself, I'm such a non-confrontational, non-competitive person. I don't know where this comes from. Oklahoma down by 21 going into the fourth quarter and the magic, the, ma the divine hand appears to be on their side. They score with like 10 minutes left. They hold them to a couple of first downs. They get the ball back, Kyler Murray, who's never lost a game, not as a Sooner, not as an Allen Eagle, not ever, and takes the ball first play from the line of scrimmage, goes 75 yards around the corner against a prevent defense. I had already gone to my room and I was watching it by myself. Kicked open the door, ran out, looked at my wife, my son. It's happening. And they're like, are you kidding? I'm like, it's happening. Next thing you know, guests and everybody was in my bedroom, six of us watching the magic transpire. They hold them down again, get the ball back. And as they are walking in, and I felt almost like they let them score to preserve the clock. I even said it. I said, too much time, too much time, three minutes, three minutes on the too much time. Texas starts plodding down the field. A questionable pass interference call down the left side. I say highly questionable, puts them in position for a field goal and a true freshman with the weirdest, dumbest name, Dicker the Kicker, I'm gonna say it, <laughs> walks out on the field and boots a 40-yarder to end 10 years of misery for the Texas Longhorn. And so our eyes are on Texas this morning. Anyway, as I was watching all of this transpire, the Lord spoke to me, I dare say, and said, though they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. I, I submit to you as I wrap this morning, what I heard in my head, that there is still time on the clock. As, as this woman was sitting at this well, believing after five marriages that it was pretty much a wrap, Jesus was saying to her, hey, there's still some time on the clock. I dare say when Mary and Martha stood at the graveside four days later and a stone had been rolled in place, God said, the way you see time is not the way that I see time. Death is a problem for you. Death is not even an obstacle for me. Lazarus, come forth, unwrap him and let him go. There's still some time on the clock. I don't know what it is you're struggling with this morning, but God is saying to you, there's still some time on the clock. This woman became the preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying there's still time to do things that they didn't think you could do. There's still time to do things you didn't think you could do. There's still time to write some new chapters, to write a new ending to the story that has begun so badly. Oh my gosh, what if someone sitting in here had already reclined and, and, and said to yourself that I've blown it. I, I've wasted too much time. I've done so much bad. I, what if someone sitting in here was at the well by yourself lonely, hurting, and you could just hear the voice of grace this morning one time that Jesus would be saying to you, there's, there's still some time on the clock. Don't give up. Don't give up. There's still some time on the clock. Don't give in to that mental battle with depression. There's still some time on the clock. Don't give in to the voice saying no one cares and no one loves you. There's still some time on the clock. Don't give in to the voice saying to you that church is just a sham and they're just trying to get my money. Trust me, 
You want to come here? I don't want a penny from you. You know what I want? I want you to have everything that God has to offer, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and the cross. That's what his trade is. He says, I offer you everything that, you, that I have, and I'll do it for free. Now you tell me, if I could give you eternity, what would you give back to God? I promise you, he wants all your hearts, all your soul, and all your mind. And if he looked at you one day when you were down, if he looked at you one day when everyone else had given up on you, and he said, I still love you, and there's still time on the clock, then what? What in the world? Did you forget that this morning? Does someone need to be reminded of how he found you and what he found you and what he knows about you and yet redeemed it and set it back on its feet and said, I could use it to change the world. I could use it to preach my gospel. You don't have to be perfect. As a matter of fact, he usually picked the people that had it wrong so that he could demonstrate to the world how to get it right. That's your shame you're carrying this morning, not his shame. And I promise you, if you would grab hold of grace this morning, you can let go of all the shame in your life. And the church said, amen. Put your hands together, stand up on your feet, and we are going to worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of all grace.